Good morning, everybody. Welcome to chapel. Today is a great day because we have snow on the ground, and that's always a great day. And we are here for chapel to hear God's word and sing his praise. We have a special guest from the Norfolk Rescue Mission. You will meet him later. Uh, but for now, we are going to start with a song, and I would love if you would please stand and sing. places upon us his holy armor. You may have a seat.
this time, we are going to actually collect our offering. Uh, collect our offering. Well, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. We're, yeah. Almost. We're going to collect our offering, which just so happens to be going to the Norfolk Rescue Mission. Um, and we will hear more about that in just a few more minutes. Um, but let's have the acolytes and ushers come forward. And while the offering is being collected, we will see you.
merciful Father, through your holy baptism, you called us to be your own possession. Grant that our lives may evidence the working of your Holy Spirit in love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. According to the image of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in Join me in Luther's morning prayer. I pray. Thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and that the grace of the King be this day also with you. Amen. 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 strength and power of God the Father, the love and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the help of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Put on the whole armor of God. You may have a seat, and now at this time I'd like to call up our friend Pastor Will from the Norfolk Rescue Mission. Everybody please say, good morning Pastor Will. And good morning, everybody. Well, I was tricked earlier. I was told when you see your slide, you head on up. And I saw the Norfolk Rescue Mission slide and started heading up, but there were two. So uh, welcome and uh, thank you. As I look up here, I'm pretty amazed at your generosity. That's awesome. Um, we've been coming out to uh, your chapel service uh, annually for quite some time and maybe some of you older kids have either seen me or someone else from the mission come out but we sure appreciate that you remember us every year and invite us to come I noticed the uh, most of your readings and your songs this morning come from a passage in Ephesians chapter 6 about the armor of God so I thought we would use that as our text this morning Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, over the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may, able, may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And then at this point is when he lists off the different pieces of armor that you sang about and read about just a few moments ago. Things like the belt of truth and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which Paul identifies as the word of God. And so when, when Paul is talking about these things, his point of reference was a Roman soldier. Paul knew a lot about Roman soldiers because he got in trouble quite a bit by the law for preaching the gospel. And he's looking at all of their equipment and he realizes, you know what, there's a spiritual lesson here. Now, a soldier or a law officer, because they really served as both in that day, well, they've got a lot of equipment on. Today, when you look out on a street corner, you don't see a Roman soldier, but you might see a county sheriff or a police officer, and he or she is wearing a lot of the same equipment as the Roman soldier. Uh, certainly, a law officer is wearing a belt, and in fact, almost all their equipment is on their belt. 
and a law officer isn't carrying a sword, today he carries a firearm on his belt, he is wearing a blessed breastplate of righteousness in the form of like body armor or some kind of protective vest. If there's a riot or something really troublesome going on, law enforcement even have helmets they can put on, just like the helmet of salvation. And there are shields that they can pick up if there was a riot or something terrible happening. The same equipment that the Apostle Paul references for a Roman soldier is what law enforcement or our military uses today. And we have to ask the question ultimately, what is all that equipment for? And it's for protection. It not only protects the law officer or the soldier, but that soldier is willing to go out there putting on all of that gear to protect you and to protect me. Which is why any time that you encounter someone in law enforcement or someone who has served in the military, take time to thank that person because that man or that woman has made a huge sacrifice to go put themselves into harm's way to protect you. Now, let's think about that now back to Ephesians 6 and the Norfolk Rescue Mission. We as Christians are being called to put on that armor. We are being called to go engage the enemy in battle. And we don't just do that to protect ourselves, but I would do that to protect the members of my household. And as Christians, we're also to do that for those who don't have on any armor. And, and that's the appropriate response. When you have the ability to fight and to protect those that don't have that ability, then it's your duty. Now, I noticed as you walked in and even as the way that you're seated, you've got the older students paired with the younger students. And, and I see that as being done as a means of not only keeping order, but you're providing shepherding and protection and you're nurturing and watching over the little ones. And you're doing that because you older students and you teachers and aides and whatnot, you've got something that they don't have. You've got some more maturity and you're bigger and stronger, and you're able to help nurture and protect them. And we have the same thing at the Norfolk Rescue Mission in the sense that, that we have resources, and you've provided quite a few of them here for us today. We have resources that someone else doesn't have. And, and we have the resource of a place to live, and a dining hall to eat, and laundry machines to wash clothes, and we've got soap and food and plates and all of the you know, clothing items and everything that's needed to live. God has provided it to us because someone else doesn't have those things. And so in the same way that the soldier has all of that gear that we don't have and he goes out to protect us. Well, we as Christians, we've got a lot of stuff that the homeless and the hurting don't have. And it's our duty to protect them. It's our duty to put on the armor of God on their behalf and to stand against the wiles or the attacks of the devil and, and guard them. Now, our hope is that in doing so, you remember one of the pieces of the armor talks about putting on your boots or your sandals in the preparation of sharing the gospel. And that's one of the primary functions of our rescue mission is that we want to share the gospel, the message of Jesus, with people who are lost, so that, guess what? They can become Christians, and then they can start putting on their own armor and begin developing their shield of faith and helmet of salvation and belt of truth and so forth. So it's not that we have the armor and they don't, but through the gospel, they can begin, uh, you know, entering into the church and ultimately, they can do the same as well. I want to make sure I leave plenty of time for you to ask questions and, and learn what it is that we do at the Rescue Mission. I'm just going to briefly tell you about some of our programs, and then I'm going to hand it over to you for some questions. So we have a number of buildings and dorms on campus. So men, women, or families with children that don't have a place to stay can come and live with us for a season. And uh, the adults look for work, 
and get jobs in the community and save their money and work on finding you know, an apartment to rent or a house to rent, and then they could move out independently and, and get a fresh start. Um, we've also got programs for people that are really bogged down with sin, and it's just destroyed their lives, and, and simply getting a job and saving up some money isn't going to be enough to fix it. They need a lot of Christian discipleship and a lot of help. So they can stay in a longer program at the rescue mission and learn how to overcome their old sinful life and start over new in Christ. We have a jail ministry in which we have uh, some of our staff and volunteers go out every week to different county jails. And we work with the inmates, both men and women, who have they've done something to break the law and they've gone to jail. But just because they've done something wrong, it doesn't mean that God abandons them. Because you and I, we've done something wrong and we've broken the law of God. And yet, by the grace of God, there is the gospel. And, and we bring that same grace of God into the county jails and we share the hope of Christ with those men and women. And hopefully, when they get released from jail, they can come to the mission and continue being discipled in their new faith. So uh, we also have the ability to feed people uh, meals and not just the folks that are staying at the mission, but men and women and families in the community that just don't have enough to make meals every day. They can come and join us for meals. We have a breakfast, lunch, and supper every day. Um, and then we also provide things like clothing and furniture and, and whatnot for families that are in need, uh, especially for, let's say someone's been staying at the mission and then he's gotten a job and he's finally got an apartment and he's gonna move out, but that apartment's empty. It doesn't have anything. So we can give him a bed and a couch and a microwave and a coffee pot and some dishes and all of those types of things so that he can get a fresh start. So that's a little bit about what we do. Let me take some questions from you now. Yes, sir. What's the biggest program you've done or do? Okay, so the biggest program uh, the one that we put the most focus and emphasis on is what's called the New Life Program. And those are the men and the women that come with like the, they've been using drugs or they've been drinking alcohol and they've just really been stuck in sin and they want to start over in Christ. That's the one we focus most on. Let's go way over on this side. Yes. Good question. Uh, it changes every day. Uh, we usually have somewhere right now in the 20s staying with us overnight. Yes? Do they have clothing on the show? Yes. Uh, we have clothing available at the rescue mission. Some people, when they check in, what they're wearing is all the clothes that they own. We once had a man who, got, who went to jail in July wearing a t-shirt and a pair of shorts. And he got out of jail in the winter and when he gets out of jail, they give him back his clothes, and he walks out of that jail wearing t-shirt and shorts. And he was cold. And But when he got to the rescue mission, we could give him pants and a jacket and all the things that he would need so that he'd have a few changes of clothes and be warm. So yes, we've got clothes for them if they don't have very many. Okay, way in the back. Everything that we offer to the people staying with us, we offer for free. We do that, or we're able to do that, because someone else has paid for it. Technically, nothing is free. Even the gospel isn't free because Jesus had to pay for it. So when we look at our, even our salvation, and we say it's free to us, it's a gift of grace. But who bought it? Jesus, with his blood. Everything gets paid for. So we give things to people for free, but it's because people like your class and your church and your families, they donate money to the rescue mission, and that's how it makes things free for our people. All right, who else has a question? Right here. Is drinking alcohol a sin? Ooh, deep question for a chapel message. <clears throat> Well, you're going to get different answers based on who answers that question. We do see the consumption of alcohol in Scripture, but we see very clearly that drunkenness is sin. And so the, the simplest answer 
would be that drinking to excess, which is drunkenness, is absolutely sin. At the rescue mission, the people that have come to us because they've always struggled with alcohol, then for them, one drink would in a sense be sin because it's going to lead to two and lead to five, and the next thing you know, they've lost everything. And so for some of us, we have to recognize that certain things are just off limits. And I personally never struggled with alcohol, but as being a rescue mission pastor, I have to just not consume any alcohol because I can't be seen shopping at hy V for a case of beer and have the people at the mission see me doing that. So I just completely abstain myself as well. Yes? Uh, how many people do you have a year? Oh boy, that I don't know that statistic. Um, so I'm going to have to send a number back to your administrator with that one, okay? All right, let's go in the red back there. If we've got someone that is sick, we'll do our best to isolate them either at the far end of a dorm. And we have multiple dorms, so depending upon how many people we have, we might be able to put them in a dorm on their own for a time. So we, we do our best to quarantine folks, and we keep them out of the dining hall so they're not coming up to the food line and coughing on the tacos and things. Yes. Okay, you can, you'll can you remember in a moment. Let's go right over there. How many dorms? Let's see, we have one, well, some of them are individual bedrooms for the men and women on our long-term New Life program. Um, but let's see, one, two, three, four, five, including also family spaces, I would say we have six different dorm spaces. How old can you be? Well, you to come on your own, you have to be at least 19. And we've had people in their 80s even stay with us. Uh, so we've had elderly people stay as well. Yep. Let's go right over there. Can someone give me that? Number? Well, we have a staff of about 11. But then we also have a lot of volunteers, volunteer groups that come in and help us sort the clothes. They help us stuff envelopes for a mailer. They help do housekeeping or projects. Uh, and a lot of them help by providing meals. And so different groups and churches might sponsor and say, I'll take the second Monday every month and our church group will come in and cook supper. So there's a lot of people that come in and help uh, and there's a lot of volunteers in our jail ministry as well that go out and visit with the inmates. But we have a staff of about 11. Yes? How long are they able to stay? Okay, that depends on the program. Uh, if someone is coming with an addiction to, you know, a big sin, then that program lasts about a year. Because we want to have enough time to be able to work with them and help them to overcome that and get a fresh start in Christ and really build a good foundation. If they're coming just to get a job and start over, then they've got three weeks to find a job. And then if they find it and they're working it and saving their money, they can continue to get extensions for three weeks at a time up to a period of 90 days. So it all just depends on what kind of program they're on. Um, and there's a third program as well that's kind of somewhere in the middle. But... Their length of stay is always determined by, are they continuing to make progress and be responsible? And if somebody just wanted to say, I want to stay at the rescue mission, but I don't want to work, and I don't want to study, and I don't want to be responsible, well, then he's not going to be able to stay much at all. Let's go right there. The furthest I've traveled for preaching. Ooh, interesting. Um, probably only about an hour, because if I start going too far south, then there's also the Columbus Rescue Mission. And if I start heading up to the northeast, there's the Sioux City Gospel Mission 
right there on the corner of Iowa and Nebraska. So we, and then obviously Omaha and Lincoln are covered with rescue missions as well. So we're kind of limited to about five or six counties up in Northeast Nebraska. Otherwise, I don't want to go speaking and fundraising in someone else's territory. Okay, let's go in the black hoodie. Yep. Do they have to share? Uh, yes, the, the main men's and women's dorm rooms for the overnight guests is what we call them. They are a series of bunk beds lined up, and, uh, and so there's top bunks and bottom bunks and a shared bathroom, and it's certainly a lot warmer than sleeping out in the ice. So it's an encourage it's something and it's nice, but it's also an encouragement for them to get a job, work hard, save their money, so eventually they can have their own apartment, their own bedroom, and not have to share with anyone. And that way they're motivated because they want to get out of the dorms and into their own space. And I'm guessing Two I'm more questions. Maybe? Two more questions. So we'll do one on this side. Let's go light blue t-shirt, young lady. How many people come in each year? How many people come in each year? Each year? OK, that was his question. And I don't have that answer. I didn't get that statistic for you. I'm going to call back to your principal and give them that number with an estimate. So we won't count that as a real question. All right. Have we taken the whole rescue mission somewhere else, like on a trip? The discipleship program, yes. We, every year we try to take them, well, every month we try to do something special with them, whether it's going bowling or going to a movie or taking them to the zoo, but we also have taken them on camping trips or to conferences, um, like up to the Black Hills in South Dakota, we've done that before. So the men and women who are on our long-term program, we can take them on trips and do some special things with them. And we'll do one more over here and let's go with this gentleman. How long can you stay? <clears throat> and that's one we talked about just a moment ago based on the different programs. So if you're looking for a job and just wanting to save money, then it's a matter of so many weeks. If you come to me and say, my life is a wreck, I need to start over in Christ, then you can stay for a program that lasts a year. So, you've had good questions today. Thank you. Hey, help me thank Pastor Will for coming and joining us today, telling us about the Norfolk Rescue Mission. Awesome mission you guys do there. Help me thank him. And before he goes, I want to pray for him. Can you guys hands, heads, and eyes, let's pray for Pastor Will and the mission they have at the North Press Commission. Dear God, we thank you for all the ways that you work. Your hands and feet on earth. We thank you for the Norfolk Rescue Mission, the passion that you give them. We thank you for Pastor Will, the time that he puts in. Lord, it's got to be tough at times seeing so many broken people. We pray that he feels the rewarding nature of it also. Seeing people going from the depths to reuniting with you, to growing your faith, to getting on their feet. Um, thank you for that work. We know that anything that we do for the least of these, we've done for you. We thank you for their work with the people that need you the most, because ultimately they're doing it for you. We pray that you would bless them and their mission, and help us to see all the missions around us and the ways that we can support them. And all God's children said, amen. amen.